Hello, my name is Matt Gerbrick. I'm an instructional designer and a student at Wright State University. And this video is about cognitive load theory and about the cognitive theory of multimedia learning based on the Cambridge Handbook of Multimedia Learning by Richard Mayer. First off, we need to remember that instructional design is about constructing courses and content that maximize student learning. And it requires careful planning and considering students' prior knowledge and learning styles. We're going to start off with cognitive load theory. Not exactly this kind of a load, but think about it in terms of what your working memory has to deal with. Now, your working memory is where information comes from your, from your sensory memory into your working memory, and that's where it needs to be processed and it moves on into long-term memory. This is a really key point here and an important time because it's limited in its, uh, in its size and in its length of time that it can work. So your working memory is generally limited to about seven to nine items, and it usually lasts between 20 and 30 seconds long. So not a lot of time to get that information in, processed, and stored in your long-term memory. Here's a quick little exercise. I won't go through this entirely, but if I gave you these 12 numbers and I said, remember as many of them as you can and you have 30 seconds, go. How many do you think you could remember? As I mentioned already, most people it's somewhere between seven and nine elements that they can remember, bits of information. And again, they can only recall them for about 20 seconds or so. So you think about seven to nine and think about phone numbers, seven numbers. Maybe a coincidence. Hmm. When we're looking at cognitive load theory, there's three different types of load that we're going to talk about. There's extraneous, there's intrinsic, and there's germane. And we're going to start off looking at the intrinsic cognitive load, which is the load that is imposed by the learning task. In other words, how you perceive or how difficult you think a task is going to be, how complex. Here's an example here. This, most people would find to be a rather complex, daunting looking task. Uh, questionable whether you'd even know what this is about. So this would, would definitely impose a high load or high co cognitive load uh, intrinsically. You would look at this and say, oh my, I'm not really sure where to start with this. This might not even be difficult. We, we don't know. I don't know what this is, but it appears to be a pretty difficult, uh, complex task or concept that you'd have to grasp. Let's use another example. And this is about presentation. It takes a lot of thought here. We have a, a six parking spots here, and we want to try and figure out what the number of the spot is that the car is parked. And the way I've presented this to you is we've got six spaces, and the number 16, 6, 68, 88, then there's the car, and then 98. I'm not seeing a pattern here. I, I, I'm really not sure, I'm not sure that I really could figure this one out. I have some high intrinsic load right now because I, I'm not sure that I can do this. And I'm a little concerned that maybe I'll look foolish. Um, but essentially I won't be able to accomplish this task because of its difficulty. However, what if it's presented this way? All we did was flip the picture. 86, space, 88, 89, 90, 91. Shouldn't be any intrinsic cognitive load to figure out that the answer to this is 87. The next type of cognitive load we want to look at is extraneous. And this is the type that is due to unnecessary information and poor design. I show you this steering wheel example here because let's pretend that you're a 16 year old just learning how to drive and you're concerned with not hitting anyone or anything. And the last thing you need is a lot of extra things going on. Uh, in this example here, there's probably some entertainment uh, type of buttons, climate control, uh, unnecessary gadgets that are really not part of learning to drive. Uh, in fact, they're probably distractions for anybody, but especially for a beginner driver. So presenting a, a, a kid with a car like this would, would be a poor design. It'd be a poor idea to say, here you go, let's go figure out if you can drive. On the other hand, 
This type of a vehicle, this is the AMC Pacer, a classic, uh, is really kind of a meat and potatoes kind of car. We got a steering wheel, we've got AM radio, we've got gear shifter, gas pedal, brake pedal. What, what more do you need, you know? So this is going to be a much better choice of vehicle for us uh, in terms of uh, teaching a, a kid how to learn to drive. Another example of extraneous material. All these lights, all I want to do is cross a street. I'm really not sure what I'm supposed to be doing here. There's a lot of load here, and this could even somewhat be intrinsic, but all I need, there's too much interference here. All I really need is this. So we want to try and minimize unnecessary things like this so we don't have people like this in your class. The next type and the last type of cognitive load in the cognitive load theory is germane. And that is the effective cognitive load. It's, it's the good type of cognitive load. It is equates to learning and we'll go to active processing here later on in, in, in the video. So this is mental effort that's being expended for good reasons. Um, and this is taking your, what's going on in your working memory and transferring it into long-term memory so you can use it uh, in, for the future. And here is an example of some load being processed. Pretty cool. Okay, so the next thing we want to look at is cognitive theory of multimedia learning. Now, let's think about multimedia. A lot of us think about this. You know, we've got all kinds of gadgets, electronics, computers, all that is being multimedia, and it is. But multimedia is just a video and an audio message being combined to try and uh, convey information. A book, a chalkboard, and talking could be examples. So it doesn't have to be anything too, too technical. The cognitive theory of multimedia learning is based on three assumptions. And the first is that we have dual channels. And I just mentioned this a minute ago. Our dual channels would be our audio channel and our video or visual channels. And we, they say that based on this theory that we take in information through these two different channels, through ears and through eyes. And you don't want to overload one or the other. You want to make sure that your presentation is balanced so we don't have too much going on with either visual or audio. So, and, and the only real uh, question about this is written text. Some believe that written text is a visual type of, uses your visual channel. Others believe that it actually uses your audio channel. Even if you're reading silently, you're in your mind, you're transferring those words in print into your memory by the audio channel. So it's really the only kind of uh, uncertainty about which channel is uh, designated for what type of information or presentation. And think about if you overload one channel or the other, you know, you've got all these noises going on at the same time, all kinds of people talking, or again, noises and hand talk, or whatever it is in the background. That's going to overload your audio channel and probably cause you difficulty with being able to uh, focus and, and uh, process. Similarly, visual, if you've got too many things to watch, you're overly stimulated visually, uh, you may not be able to focus on the important uh, channel or the important information that you're supposed to be receiving. The second assumption is limited capacity. And limited capacity just means that there's only so much information that your mind can, can or your working memory can handle at a time. And this equates similarly to uh, extraneous information that we want to limit the extraneous information uh, that is being presented because we've only got so much space. I've got these sticks of RAM here because this is, uh, you know, the, the working memory in a computer. And if you give it a whole bunch of tasks to try and do, and you've got all kinds of windows open and applications open, you're really going to be taxing this, and this is when your computer gets slow and you get upset. So you want to limit the amount of, of, uh, inf of, of information and things that are being 
loaded onto your into your uh, working memory. So just keep in mind you have a limited capacity. Okay, and then active processing. We've got to see that's the third assumption. And active processing deals with three things: attending to relevant information, organizing selected information, and integrating information. Okay, those three things are what goes into uh, your active processing. Similar, we just saw this with germane load. The same thing. Germane load is where you are, you're, you're learning. That's where the learning is taking place, where information is going from your working memory into your long-term memory. And this active processing, it's the same principle. So how does exactly is this look, what does this look like? Well, think about a puzzle. You see the picture, you see the pieces. You're going to organize them, and you're going to put them together to make a puzzle or make a picture. Okay, and that's what the three parts to active processing are. They're selecting, organizing, and integrating. Select the picture, see the pieces, those are organized, and they're organized, integrated together to make the puzzle picture that you're trying to, to uh, put together. Another example, we're going to build a shed. Okay, so that's our selection. We've selected a shed that we're going to build. Now we're going to organize. We're going to organize things based on what type of materials, okay? And, and, and then we're going to look at integrating. We're gonna put them all together to make this shed. And I'm also gonna organize this sequentially. Here's how you put it together. The base or the foundation, the walls, the roof, the siding, and all the uh, extra, uh, uh, the, the outside. So those are the, that's, those are the three assumptions, dual channels, limited capacity, and active processing. Now I want to look at the three principles that are involved in making um, quality instructional content and things that you want to try and avoid um, in order to do so. Uh, these are three principles that we've, that we've talked about in, in designing. And one is a redundancy principle we want to try and avoid. Redundancy principle involves having narration and on-screen text at the same time with graphics. So you don't want to overload people. Uh, this goes back to our dual channels. If we've got a uh, graphic and we've got narration and we've got on-screen graphics and we've got on-screen text like closed captioning, um, it, it's overload, it's too much. Uh, example. It's important to be a great free throw shooter, not just if you're fouled, but so that you're on the court late in the game. Okay, so that brief example there, he's going to go through shot mechanics, there was the coach talking, there was some closed captioning there that actually had some errors in it, and then there were call-out arrows showing some obvious information later on in that video. So in order to fix this and be um, as, as in line with the redundancy principle, we would want to remove the extraneous material. We want to get rid of the closed captioning unless you were in need of that and different call outs and things that were unnecessary or were distractions. Coherence is a second principle we're going to look at and that's that people learn more deeply from a multimedia message when extraneous material is excluded. Now this again sounds a lot like limited capacity and it also goes along with the extraneous load. We want to try and not get off topic and talk about things that aren't relevant to what the lesson is about. This example here, we could be talking about tigers, we could be talking about where they're from, different varieties, different types, and, and photographs of them, and then all of a sudden start talking about tiger woods. Obviously, there's some issues here with our coherence that tiger woods is not part of the conversation other than his nickname happens to be tiger. And then the third design principle is spatial contiguity. This is about making sure that text and pictures are in proximity to each other. This example here, we've got vocabulary and a drawing, and then we've got, um, we've got the text away from it. In this example here, same thing, we've got maple tree, coconut tree, with a lot of red, uh, black space in between. We should narrow that and make it like this, so that the words and the pictures are near each other. 
The last thing we want to look at is refutation text and how that affects my field. As an instructional designer, one of the things that I have to try and refute and try and change the thinking and habits of, of the instructors where I work is that they are the only source of, of information and that their lecture is most important. And it's the only way that students can learn. So I'm going to get behind the camera like this and I'm just going to tell you everything you need to know. And that's the way it goes. You're going to take a quiz and so forth because that's the way I learn. And that's one of the misconceptions that we want to try and overcome here. And so the, the refutation cue to this, if I, so that's the misconception. The cue that I'm going to try and, and, and present to them is that the instructor lecture is not the only source of information and that students can learn in a variety of ways. And I say this because I want them to understand that research indicates that learner-centered approaches are more effective to teaching than just having a lecture. So any kind of inter interaction that we can create is going to be beneficial to students. And that is an example of how I could use uh, refutation text or refutation um, uh, information in uh, my, my field. Professional impacts would be that I would be challenging instru instructors prior knowledge about how they teach and their, um, their strategies or their um, approaches to it. And I would encourage instructors to consider students' intrinsic needs and students' learning um, styles. I want to leave you with one quote here. Um, this is from Terry Doyle and from the book um, Learner-Centered Teaching. Whoa. Learner-Centered Teaching and Putting Research on Learning into Practice. The quote is, he who does the work does the learning. And I think that's one of the things that we have to keep in mind is that we can talk about these things and we can spend lots of time uh, designing instruction. But in the end, if the students are being are passive and are not involved and we're not adhering to these uh, principles and these theories, then we're going to struggle. So I hope you'll keep these things in mind as you go out there and, and create content and, and hopefully improve students' learning and, and make it make it fun, but make it effective. Thank you.